Hi, how you doing? It's a lovely evening and I thought it might be fun to go back to our stories of greatness. Uh, so this time we're going to look at the lives, the life of one of, to my mind, the most impressive fighters from the pugilistic era. Um, now obviously all of these people that I'm talking about were hugely influential and achieved a vast amount during their careers. But this man probably achieved more than anybody else. Um, and his name is Tom Molyneux. Tom Molyneux was born in 1784 into slavery in Virginia. He was owned by the, the Molyneux family, which were descended from the, the Earl of Sefton and for five generations had owned a large plantation in Virginia and were vastly wealthy. Now Tom, luckily, I suppose, if you can call being born a slave lucky in any way, um, was the personal slave of Algernon Molyneux, who was the son of the plantation owner. He was part manservant, part bodyguard, part companion, and part general entertainment to, to Algernon, um, who, <clears throat> to all intents and purposes, was a relatively spoiled, hugely privileged young man. He liked to, to pretend that he lived in high society in England, in London, so what he'd do is he'd gather his friends and, and acquaintances together and he'd put on fights between his slopes. And Tom always won. Um, it seemed that Tom was naturally very good. He was very powerfully built. And the, the Molyny family were, were known for relatively kind treatment of their slaves, so he was well fed. And he was genetically disposed to being a large, muscly man. Um, Tom was so impressed with him, uh, sorry Tom, Algernon was so impressed with Tom as a fighter that one drunken night in 1804 he was gambling alongside uh, an acquaintance of his, a man by the name of Peyton, who'd recently inherited his father's plantation after his father had died. Um, and Peyton had, had basically claimed that his slave, Abe, was the slave champion of all Virginia and that he'd beat any other slave. Um, Algernon wasn't having this because he was very, very drunk indeed. Um, and he announced that Tom could beat him. His slave Tom could beat Abe Payton. Um, so the two of them said, OK, let's have them fight in two months' time. The next morning, when Algernon woke up, he realised with that kind of crushing remembrance that you get with a hangover that you've done something really stupid when you were drunk the night before. It turned out that not only had he announced that his young companion, um, who was I believe 19 at the time, was in fact better than a Payton who was genuinely the slave champion of all Virginia, but that he bet a hundred thousand dollars on the outcome of the fight. So, being that he didn't have a hundred thousand dollars, he he had a number of choices. The first choice was to go and talk to his father, who did have a hundred thousand dollars to spare. He had many, many hundreds of thousands of dollars to spare, but he was very much against gambling, so Algernon couldn't go to him. Uh, so he could potentially go to Peyton and say, no, sorry, it's a bit drunk, let's forget about it. But he was a very, very proud man, and he wasn't going to let that happen. So the only option left to him was to find a trainer for Tom and make sure he won the fight. So he sent his men out to try and find somebody who could teach Tom how to box properly. And that he did. He found an old English sailor by the name of Davis, who'd used to box in his youth in Bristol, 
alongside none other than Jack Slack. Davis was immediately employed by Algernon to train Tom in fighting. Davis, we don't know a great deal about him, but the impression you get from reading was that he didn't really approve of slavery. And he got on very well with Tom. Um, and while the two of them were supposedly training, they became very close friends. And after a couple of weeks, Davis went to Angel Algernon Molyneux with what was clearly a pretty clever ruse. He told Molyneux that Tom just wasn't having it. He, he just didn't care. You know, there was nothing in it for him. He wasn't going to train. He wasn't going to go through the rigours of training in order to just have a fight and, and keep going. He just, yeah. And there was nothing Davis could do. Absolutely no way he could possibly encourage Tom to, to fight and to train properly. Oh, except one thing. Maybe if you promised him his freedom and a hundred dollars for winning, maybe that would help. Um, so Algernon Molyneux did exactly that. He said to Tom, if you win this fight, you can have your freedom and I'll give you a hundred dollars to the bargain. Clearly that worked and training went pretty well after that. Um, I've yet to find any detailed records of the fight. Um, it took place, as it was, was planned, two months after the drunken bet and Tom Molyneux utterly destroyed Abraham Payton. Um, so, interestingly, the slave champion of all Virginia, Tom Molyneux, was no longer the slave champion of all Virginia because Abra Algernon Molyneux was as good as his word and he gave Tom Molyneux his freedom and instead of a hundred dollars he gave him five hundred dollars and sent him on his way. So Molyneux and Davis set off together for New York and in New York they, they made a good partnership and Davis trained Tom and Tom fought and he beat anybody that, that came near him. And five years later, he'd beaten pretty much everyone else that was willing to fight. And in 1809, he declared himself champion of all America. And as far as we can tell, he was the first person to ever do that. Um, he knew, really though, that if he wanted proper respect and money, he'd have to travel to England and he'd have to fight there. Because being champion of all America was one thing, being champion of all England was a very different thing altogether. So Davis and he parted ways, and Tom paid for his passage to England. And while there, he travelled to London, and he met a gentleman by the name of Bill Richmond. Bill Richmond was another former slave, who had done relatively well for himself as a boxer, uh, but never achieved the greatest of heights. Um, but off the back of that, had set himself up as a boxing trainer and promoter. And he took Tom Molyneux under his wing. He introduced him to a number of members of the fancy, who took an instant liking to Molyneux. He had the build of a boxer, and he clearly could fight. They set him up with a fight, which he won very quickly indeed. So they set him up with another fight, which he won very quickly indeed, until it became very clear that the only person that was likely to challenge Molyneux in any way was none other than Tom Cribb, the champion of all England. Now Cribb hadn't fought for a little while and was quite enjoying not fighting. He'd recently got married and he was very much enjoying the connections he'd made as a successful boxer especially as he didn't have to defend his championship. Technically, he'd retired, even though officially he hadn't. So when he was challenged to fight Molyneux, he said no. So at that point, Bill Richmond did a pretty cunning thing. He treated the championship as if it was vacant, even though it wasn't actually vacant. So he announced to the world to the fancy, that his man, 
Tom Molyneux was champion of all England and that he would fight any man that disputed this. Turns out that's exactly what it needed to encourage Cribb to fight him. So in December in 1810, in a small village on the green, not far from East Grinstead, Cribb and Molyneux met to fight. Uh, the superintendent of the day was none other than Mr Jackson, who we'd met in a previous video. And the two of them stepped into the ring to fight each other. Now initially, the fight went either way. Tom Cribb was solid, he was strong and he was hugely experienced. Molyneux was immense, a hugely built, immensely strong man, but he didn't have the experience that Cribb had. So some rounds went one way, some rounds went the other way, and the two were fighting and it was relatively even. And nobody could say for certain who was going to win. And this worried the fancy massively, because there was no way they were going to let a black man, or even worse, an American, win the title. But Molyneux had other ideas. He caught Cribb with one of the most powerful punches that had been seen to that day. Nobody at this point had ever knocked Cribb out. Molyneux did. He caught him clean and he caught him hard and Cribb dropped like a sack of stones to the floor. There was no way Absolutely no way Cribb was getting back to his feet within the 30 seconds to come up to scratch. It simply was not going to happen. But they couldn't let Molyneux win. Cribb's seconds charged into the ring to try and stand him up, accusing Molyneux of cheating. What they accused him of was concealing lead bullets inside his fists so he could hit harder. Jackson came in, the umpires came in, the bottle holders came in, and by the time Molyneux had proven that he hadn't been cheating, that he hadn't been holding lead bullets in his hands, Cribb had been revived, and he'd been brought back up to scratch. And at that point, despite the fact that Molyneux had already won, according to the accepted rules, the fight carried on. As you can imagine, Molyneux was a little unhappy about this, but he had no choice. He had to win this fight decisively if he was going to be acclaimed champion of all England. Now, bear in mind that at this point, within that ring, what we had was the champion of all England in Cribb and the champion of all America in Molyneux. So, effectively, what we had was the first true world title fight. You can see where this is going. Cribb was always going to win that fight. Even if he didn't win it, Cribb was going to win it. And um, clearly, he hadn't won it, he'd lost it, but he was still going to win it. The two of them fought some more, and Cribb did relatively well. He'd got his head back in the game, he'd come round, but Molyneux managed to pin him against the ropes and was, was hitting him, and the two kind of came to a clinch, and the crowd rushed forward. The crowd of some 5,000 people charged towards the ring to try and pull the fighters apart. They didn't want to see the two of them standing in a clinch grappling with each other. What they wanted was to see punching. They wanted to see proper fighting. And as they pulled the two fighters apart, by some strange coincidence, somebody, and we've no idea who, managed to inadvertently break some of Molyneux's fingers. So. He'd already knocked Cribb out, and he'd already got him in a position where he couldn't escape from and was going to, to, to beat him again. But the fight went on. After, after some more rounds, the injuries to Molyneux's hand started to tell, and Cribb gradually started to get an edge over him. And this was one of the reasons that Cribb was a champion, because he had immense bottom. He could keep fighting when nobody else would have been able to. Nobody else would have been able to take the punishment that Molyneux was dishing out and carry on fighting. But Cribb could. And eventually, 
eventually Molyneux gave in. He knew at that point that he was never going to win this fight. So rather than take any more punishment, he didn't come up to scratch. And he went away <sighs> disheartened, is probably the kindest way of describing it. And he went back to his trainer, Bill Richmond, and the two of them had a bit of a falling out because Molyneux felt that he hadn't really been fairly dealt with, and rightly so. Um, and the two of them went their separate ways. But Molyneux still had his supporters within the fancy, and they encouraged him to write to Crib and demand a rematch. So he did. He wrote to Crib and he told him that he'd been advised that if the weather had not been quite so inclement, um, there was driving sleet in the morning of their fight, that Molyneux would have walked away victorious. And so he would like to claim a second fight. Cribb couldn't say no. But without Richmond backing him, Molyneux didn't have the self-discipline to, to train effectively. And the second fight was much, much shorter. And it was pretty much a whitewash. Cribb, who'd got back into training, and Molyneux had stopped training, and the two were, were effectively in a different class at this point. Molyneux had lost his heart, and Cribb had a point to prove. And in the second fight, Cribb knocked Molyneux clean out, and in a relatively short space of time, won the fight. At that point, Molyneux was pretty much a broken man. Which is, which is a real shame, because more than anybody else, Molyneux had, had taken charge of his own life, his own destiny, and he'd made it happen. He'd fought his way from being somebody's plaything, their possession, to fighting against the greatest fighter known in the presence of some of the richest and most powerful men in the world. And he'd done that all off the strength of his arms, his fists, and his heart. Yet, <coughs> because the English fancy at the time were not willing to let a foreigner and a black man win the title, that was all taken from him. And he, for a number of years, he travelled around and he made a pretty poor living from fighting exhibition matches against anybody that would fight him for money. Until, at the age of 38, he died a shadow of his former self. And that's the story of Tom Molyneux, the man who should have been the first world champion boxer. Um, alas, no, that title goes to Crib. Um, thoroughly undeservedly, it was Molyneux. Twice it was Molyneux. But, so be it. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, it, there are some other stories of greatness. Check out the story about uh, Jack Broughton. Check out Jack Slack. Uh, please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already subscribed. That would be great. If you can, like this video, stick a comment down. Tell me what you think about Molyneux. Uh, is there anything about him that you've heard that I haven't um, told you about? Or what do you think? Um, should he be the first champion? Um, was he the first champion of the world? I'd say so, but I don't know. Um, if you can spare a dollar a month or more, um, please consider visiting my Patreon page. Uh, you can support me by donating anything from a dollar a month upwards to help me make more videos like this. And yeah, check out some of the other videos while you're here. Anyway, I'll see you soon. Take care.